All right. Välkomna till Konstakademin och ännu en föreläsning som arrangeras av Stockholms arkitektförening. I kväll så ska vi få lyssna till Max Kalén och Kristoffer Divik som vi har bjudit hit för att prata lite om sitt arbete. Max är från Tyskland och Kristoffer är från Norge. Så jag presumer att lektionen kommer att vara på The office first caught my attention a couple of years ago uh, with a small project called Twin Arch, I think, in London, uh, which was a small studio space for an artist. Uh, and it sort of had a simplicity to it that I really liked, both in terms of sort of idea and material, and I know it was also very low budget. Uh, And since then, they've been through many, many projects, uh, ranging from the smallest furniture to uh, larger buildings. And uh, they've been based in uh, London for 10 years, but now they moved to Palma and uh, Porto. Um, and we're just really happy to have them here tonight. So welcome, Max and Chris. Hey, thanks for having us. Uh, we're really happy to be here. I'm Chris. This is Max. Um, yeah, like Johanna said, we're now, uh, I guess, a European office. We used to be in London for, we lived there for 20 years almost, and then we had our practice together for 10 years. So some projects are still, or some of the projects in the presentation are in London, and then we slowly moved abroad. Um, Still work a bit in London, but not so much anymore. Um, all right, I start. Uh, when we when we think about architecture or discuss, then we 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 we're interested in thinking in kind of two tra trajectories. On the one hand side, there's the the building, and then the idea of the building is that. It's supposed to sustain a kind of a long period of time. Um, and it's a very slow discipline, architecture. So that's one thing. But then there's the person who inhabits the building, the, the user or the client. And we started to uh, think a bit about this in a way that, um, and it's a different time scale. So Uh, lifestyles change quite fast, technology changes, apartments are usually refurbished after 20 years. And, and we started to think about the, the, the user kind of like a, de a guest. And we thought there's something somehow interesting about the, the term of a guest or the, the idea of being a guest. And um, because when you're a guest, you treat your context in a slightly different way. Normally, if you, let's say, you move into a new home, uh, it's it, the idea of permanence, you know, that's the house where I want to grow old, or it somehow gives a sense of security or comfort, but we thought if you imagine yourself always as a guest, there's also something quite liberating about it in a way that um, might help to deal better with resources um, and maybe with a certain respect to the kind of building you inhabit and maybe the, the degree to which you, let's say, change, change the, the buildings. And we thought it's, so it kind of goes both ways. It's something that's interesting for us as the architect, but maybe also something interesting for everyone and also for the client as a way to think about how do we deal with the building and what's the building for or who's it made for. And obviously it's a little bit difficult because when we design a building for someone who spends a lot of money on it or little money even, um, of course you want to meet, you want to build something <laughs> that's made for purpose that they can really use. So somehow uh, it leaves then maybe the challenge to to the architect and it's something that we're, we're trying to explore is to find a language or a kind of an architecture that on the one hand side it happens to fulfill the needs that are that are, that are urgent and that that's really important for those that that move in let's say the first guests of the building 
but that there's also somehow a resilience to the building itself, like a kind of internal structure that has its own logic, which it's independent of that first, the purpose of the first guest. And it's something that we try to summarize under the topic daily camping. Um, it's something where camping is not meant as a kind of escape from reality, where you want to explore something new, um, but more uh, kind of an, should be part of everyday life and more methodology or way of kind of um, something to learn from, at least from camping. So over the last years, we've, we've worked with our students at the, the Royal College of um, Art in London, and we tried to explore this topic, um, and the students, they designed buildings backwards. So they, um, they designed them without a function, so they had to go back and think about what, what kind of architecture and what kind of form uh, do you actually like and you find promising. And then, they exp and then to basically retrospectively inhabit them and, um, and appropriate the structure and see how, how flexible is it actually. And there's this nice um, quote from Derek German. It's like a, um, a filmmaker. I said, I, I said I thought functionalism was totally crazy unless you saw architecture as disposable. The function of any modern building is bound to alter a few after a few years from the orig original intention. And then you're left with something that's not only obsolete, but also probably ugly. Buildings should be designed for pure aesthetic reasons. Form should respond to the demands of pleasure, the inward function. More often than not, you'll find that an aesthetic building is an adaptable one. And it's something, it's maybe a bit extreme, but, uh, but we thought there's something very interesting, and this is from uh, 65. So if you contextualize this, this, these words uh, in the time we live now, I think it's possible to draw quite a lot of new links to, um, uh, to economy, to, uh, to materiality, to different directions. Anyway, so I'll just flick through a few slides of, of projects that the students worked on where you start to, where they, where they uh, through, through the placement of furniture and through speculating on how the building might age, how it will be modified, they try to explore kind of possible languages and to see how, how adaptable are, are sp certain spaces. And if you look at, uh, at s some uh, other people, this case, uh, Donald Judd, what's interesting, especially with this picture, um, that Somehow you look at this and you can, you can feel that there's, there's these par two parallel worlds. There's one, one is the room, so the building itself, and then there's the, the guest. And obviously, that is, a, is, a, uh, is based in the kind of practice of art, so obviously everything is a little bit more experimental, but somehow what, what's, what's quite inspiring about this picture is that without really touching the building itself through, through the, the objects and the furniture, he, he suddenly makes the room, he takes over the room and, and uh, makes it a place. And Franz West is another example, is maybe a bit more extreme, this picture, um, who worked a lot with, um, he made furniture um, and tried to strip them down to kind of the, let's say, the most lightweight um, construction, which somehow still fulfill like an er ergonomy and kind of uh, are actually comfortable to sit, even though they don't really look so comfortable. And of course, it's a, again an artist, so his context is an art gallery, but maybe that even more um, shows these the kind of the, 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 the two strands, the, the building and how kind of the, the furniture and the habitation somehow um, runs in parallel. And, um, and uh, obviously in the exhibition it changes every few months. And, um, and then the last, uh, the last image before I hand over to Chris is that's 
even one step further, stu Super Studio, and even there you kind of sense uh, these two. There's the kind of continuous grid um, or the infrastructure, and then there's the yeah the guests, which um, where all the cl let's say the, the appliances and the kind of the the things that give you comfort or the technology, the things that actually constantly change, are the elements that are that are loose and. Um, so, we've we've divided the the talk in in in, in uh, structured in two parts. The first one is guests that Chris will introduce, and then afterwards we look at a few buildings. So, um, following on from Max's talk about our students, we um, we started going camping, you know, to try to learn. Uh, or explore how it was to, to inhabit the landscape. And, and we were quite inspired by this uh, sort of nimble, practical mindset of a camper. And, and what we found interesting, I mean, it's kind of obvious, but when you go camping, you bring along things, no? objects, tools. You, you have things that keep you uh, sheltered from the rain, from the wind. You have a ha like a hammock to sleep in. You, you bring uh, tools to cook, uh, etc. And, but at the same time, when you, when you explore the landscape, you also use existing infrastructure. So, I mean, you can find a river to get water, or you, you, you uh, find a flat area where you place your tent, or you, 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 you have uh, places to sit or cook, etc. No? And, um, and th these objects you bring with them, uh, with you are usually quite uh, lightweight, practical, and, and quite intelligent elements. And uh, these first set of uh, like furniture I'm going to show you now are sort of inspired by this uh, research we did together with the students. And um, obviously, when you inhabit a building, it's not like going camping, but you still, uh, the idea is that you, you still come with pieces of furniture that you bring along, uh, or lights, uh, etc. And, and these are sort of the, some of the first experiments that we started working on uh, last, year, last year. Um, the first sets are, we call them the flex lights. It's sort of these lights that you can bring along and place in different parts of the, the apartment. And they really, I mean, they're quite joyful in how you can kind of plug them in in different places and adapt your living conditions. And it's all these lights are made out of basic components. Uh, that you can buy in the shops. Um, then there's another set of lights that are a bit more um, proper, let's say. Or they're made also made of these uh, ready-made components that we put together in different ways. Uh, and this is what I think we call it the bay lamp or the salad bowl. Uh, they're meant to be um, super strong, no? so they, they, they are like architectural lights, let's say, so they can light up a room completely. Uh, this one light, but you can also tone them down completely, and they quite become these sort of cozy elements in the space. This is another one. I mean, they all react to the, let's say, the rooms in a kind of architectural way. So this is the one that we call it the ashtray light, but it just lights the floor, and it's made out of the components. Is this? Uh, I don't know what to call it. This round thing with the pegs sticking out is a is a heat sink. And then there's the LED f fixed to that, and then you have the adapter. And then we just made the sort of most basic structure in order to lift this off the floor and then uh, create this light. Um, there's another one. Uh, through a di few different projects, we'll also show you one later on, where we try to also design lights for the rooms that are integrated into the rooms. Uh, that is like one light source that could turn anything, all the light on in, in the room, that it's enough to have one light. And, and this is an exploration of that, uh, where we have, yeah, the most, once again, this very simple uh, practical st structure to support this uh, LED and heatsink that sits on top. And here on this version, the, the adapter is fixed to the, the base. This is the heat sink again. And then uh, this is another version where there's a round uh, base with a, a separate um, adapter. Um, 
We also uh, recently bought like an old stone house in, in, in Portugal, uh, and where we're trying to work now on trying to figure out how to actually create electricity and energy to the house. And this, which started to integrate the, the research or the the exploration of these lights into the, the this project, and uh, this is this first render is now something we're working on, which is part of a uh, landscape uh, biennale that's coming up soon, where there's an installation of uh, our lights together with furniture, and then this uh, solar panels that are connected, sitting on the outside of the building, and it becomes this independent electrical unit. I mean, it's kind of. Uh, an ex exaggeration and uh, maybe a bit naive, but uh, we, we find it very interesting to work with these, uh, especially the solar panels, and try to understand how the systems work. Because at the moment we also do bigger buildings, and then you have to now, at this moment in time, you have to start integrating either solar panels in the facade or on the roof, and to get the sense of how they work and how they feel and look is, it, we, uh, yeah, we find it quite interesting. Um, moving away from London also allows, allowed us to spend more time doing other things as well, like furniture like this, where uh, it's both simpler and cheaper to, uh, to test and work with the local steel workers. So this is a, a sofa we've designed that somehow, I mean, we imagine it more like a sort of a landscape element where you can sit in many different configurations. It's, it, it is quite comfortable and well, that was the idea, and I think it works very well as it is now. And you can use it both inside and outside. But then the idea is that uh, the user, whoever has it, can also bring their own cushions or design their own elements, throw a blanket on top, and, and adapt it however they see fit. Um, two I th or three years now, three years ago, we, we designed uh, the exhibition design for architecture a Triennale in Sharjah, uh, which is in the uh, UAE. And um, there were several venues throughout this uh, Biennale, but we're going to talk about one of them, which is this sort of boomerang, banana-shaped building uh, you can see in the center of this image. It's uh, kind of in the center. Uh, this is the main highway coming into Sharjah, and there's a bus station and a depot, and then the old... Uh, our, uh, the fresh and fresh fruit and vegetable market, and it's now been unused for several years. And we were offered it by the the local council to use it as the venue for the Biennale. And what's quite fascinating is both this sort of plan, this boomerang-shaped plan, uh, and this continues. It has this one continuous long corridor in the center, and all these food stalls on either side that continues throughout. And then, as you can see, there's uh, once in a while you have a cut through the plan where you have these uh, passages through the building. And our task was in a way to design or uh, curate a way in order for art to inhabit this building. So, and we wanted to do it with as minimal means as possible. So we worked with uh, the existing lighting. You can see these uh, halogen lights are the, the old leftover lights from the, from the fruit uh, shops. And then uh, in, some, in here you have natural light, but in some cases we just boarded up and closed the building, so it became dark. And then the, the rest is just finding a way how to inhabit the building with the, all the different arts. Uh, so we needed to provide the artists with tables or stools or vitrines, etc. And we designed them and then they were free to inhabit the different rooms. And, and there was this nice kind of overlay of the the existing uh, context of the, the fruit and vegetable uh, stalls, and then these new elements. And you can see how, for instance, in the, in the left picture, the, how the vitrine starts to interact with the mirror that was once there to, to, to show off the, the vegetables. This is part of uh, an installation in more the darker part of the, the building. But then we were also supposed to cater for a different type of space, so they wanted something which is a bit bigger, outdoor, that could cater for uh, larger events with crowds, uh, musicians, uh, cinema, etc. 
And, and what was quite sort of the most obvious thing for us uh, from the beginning was this, the, 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 the building already had this sort of hand, this kind of, that created, or this shape of a hand that had this, created this space. So uh, we introduced this one long line that cut across the building. Uh, quite a simple gesture, but it, it kind of sparked our interest. And um, what it did is that it somehow created this space where you could go in to the boomerang and out, in and out, uh, from this big open outdoor space to the, uh, to the interior. And what it meant in reality is that we, um, we, we use sand, which they have an abundance of, uh, and uh, tiles that we got from the local council, like normal pavers. And we uh, put this one long line and placed it on top, uh, the tiles, and then, because it was raised to the level of the, the market, and due to, the, to the, the fall in levels between the market and, and this parking area, uh, you got this kind of uh, new platform that was lifted maybe a bit higher than this, more like 40, 50 centimeters usually, and it would form this long bench. Um, and then we left out holes in some places where you have the trees, for instance, that was, became small areas for seating. So here you can see the, an image where you see the, the new square or the, this plaza that overlaps with the existing context in the parking lot. more up close uh, with these sort of seating underneath the trees. I mean, the most important thing down there is just shade, usually. So the trees are very valued, um, and there are not many of them. Um, and then on top of this plaza again, then we placed its different elements for the activity. So we had like a, a, another shaded area for to have tables and eating, etc. And then we had this sort of stage, this backdrop to a stage uh, on the left hand side. These are images from one of the events. Then here's this backdrop that we used for projection screens and in this case a concert. Here again you can see the looking from the, the old pavement up to the, this new plaza and into the, the, the art venue. And I'll briefly talk about another project that uh, we did last, last year, I think. It's a, we designed a small intervention in a foyer in, in the Modern Museum in Frankfurt. So it's a building by Hans Hollein. I think it was finished in 91. Um, very, very particular uh, building, quite specific in its plan and layout and design. Uh, I think it works really well, but it's, it's, it's hard to work with as a, let's say in this case we were interior architects and we, we designed uh, furniture for this building or a new foyer. But, but we really do admire him, so we tried to do as minimal intervention as possible um, and somehow honor uh, Hans Hollein and the, the building itself. So we took some, uh, inspired by some parts of the different elements in the building and adapted them. This is the uh, old uh, foyer as it was. And we, we removed some fixed things. Uh, so you can see this dashed area is replaced by a, a new floor surface, which you can see later on, which is a red vine, uh, linoleum. And then we placed different uh, movable objects like uh, a bookshelf, a tick and counter, some benches, etc., that are spread out. And they're also movable because you, they would have events, openings, etc. So they want to have a larger space. And the final, uh, I think the final guest we'll talk about, or the furniture pieces, is um, column lights. And uh, we've had uh, several projects that have been sort of going around the idea of the column. And, and one of the first ones is this exhibition we did in the Barbican uh, uh, in the early days in London. And um, in this case, it was an exhibition about artists and their collections. So uh, 
in the, the you have uh, Hiroshi Sugimoto, which is a photographer, which you see in the corner there. That's his art and objects that he surrounds himself in his studio, and that's a copy of his desk, etc. And then on this side you have the, the, the you can see part of the collection of Damien Hirst, and and this this column on the left. Uh, we used it as, it's both a, a replica of the column that's from the studio of Sugimoto, but we used it as a sort of a spatial divider, something to separate between the two artists. So it's quite clearly not structural, but it, it, it really helps to somehow feel a, a division between the two. Um, perhaps also creates a certain type of character of the space or an atmosphere. And in this case, we used in the, in the we're working on a villa at the moment where we we're trying to uh, produce these column lights uh, again that are fixed in the space, and we 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 wanted to try and make a prototype of it. So again, we worked in in Portugal where we have a we did a small flat and we uh, removed quite a few of the walls in the living room and kitchen, and it became this one quite generous sort of open plan, uh, living and uh, kitchen area where we still felt that there was, I don't know, it just didn't, it was a bit uncomfortable and unclear the plan. So we introduced these two columns as sort of these spatial elements that would somehow, for us at least, define a bit better or make it feel more cozy or create zones within the, this open plan. So we cast in place these concrete columns that then have uh, lights on top. So. I mean, they, for us, they really worked because they, uh, you, when you're there, you kind of forget the room a bit and the focus becomes more around these elements that somehow, I don't know, for me at least, they have this scale of a human. I mean, it, it feels quite different and cozy with these elements. But the estate agent came by and he was quite, not furious, but quite, um, unhappy about these elements because he was really concerned. How, I mean, if we were to sell at some point this flat, how would you remove it and they're just in the way? But, but we were quite happy about his reaction because, I don't know, it, that was the joy of it as well. They are a bit in the way and, and, and strange, and, but we, we did appreciate and we did like that, so, yeah. Now some buildings. So um, yeah, we actually start with the twin arch, which which you mentioned a bit earlier, um, and it's in Herringay, uh, South East London, and it's it's a kind of set of peculiar, let's say, constraints and maybe coincidences that has been driving this project in a way. So basically, the site is one of these arches. Um, and the client happens to live right behind. And it's, uh, she, she has a, uh, a practice for a st set design. And um, she wanted, she needed a, a, an atelier to work. And uh, yeah, so she asked us to, to make this project and she had very little money. Um, and because she leased this, it's basically a lease hold, so she has it for I think 20 years the plot and then she has to give it a back to the council. And um, and then she wanted to share it with, with, with someone. And uh, not only to, to uh, you know, to have company, but also to pay our architect's fee. Um, so we made this deal that, uh, okay, we make two, we make two ateliers within this arch. Um, and then with the rent, she can pay our fee. So that was somehow kind of the, the economy behind this. And um, so you have the, the street, the access, main access from here, and then her garden here at the back. And we were looking for a plan that somehow, well, it had to be really st simple in its kind of principle uh, and, and also practical. And we thought it was really nice that it's, it's, it's basically because it's on top of, via on top of a viaduct um, the arch is obviously very dominant and it has a, a, um, 
We didn't want to make it a front and a back. We thought it would be really nice if there was basically two fronts. And we did develop this floor plan, which is basically mirrored bo in both axes. So you have one entrance here, and it's, these are, this is communal with the toilet, which has access to, to uh, client's name is Laura, to Laura's atelier, which with, with a big window to her garden. And then she, en she enters from the back side, which is the shared kitchen, again, uh, with access to both units. And, and her, uh, let's say, her atelier uh, tenant has the window facing the, um, the street. And the way it creates, um, it's kind of this endless loop. And even though it's very small, the kind of the, I, the, the fact that you can run in circles and the, the, the geometry of the space repeats itself in a kind of an endless way. And it's a bit childish, but also it, it felt quite powerful as a, as a principle to, to dictate, let's say, this shed. Um, and you see here the, the, the viaduct is no longer in use, so, so now it's a, it, it connects two parks. So this is the top. And this is literally the, the bottom with the, the end, that's the window of the, the, the rented atelier part. Um, you see here it has a kind of frosted glass, so um, it's actually po polycarbonate to keep it um, to keep it in budget, and um, also to avoid people to look in and uh, to avoid temptations to break into the, the atelier. Then we've, we've, on the inside, we've clad the walls with, uh, this, with 240 standard sheets uh, up to a height where you can, just to protect the wall, we can reach it. And above, we just left the, the, the vapor membrane um, exposed and we picked one that, that's reflective. So it really brings the light, uh, it kind of reflects it deep into the space. And um, that's basically the other side. With a, with a clear window which looks back at the garden. Um, the client has a lot more things in her room. Um, and then basically they, they divide the division between the two units. It's, uh, it's open at the top so that the light kind of travels um, ac across both, both units. That's the view from the other side. The, the client decided to, to paint herself and this is where she ran out of paint. Um, <laughs> but in a way, it's fine. It uh, doesn't really matter. Um, somehow, we felt that the kind of the internal logic was there, and um, somehow, uh, yeah, they she found a, a tenant to share the studio, and it somehow all worked out. Then uh, very close by, uh, again Haringey in London. It's it's a nurse. So this was a competition we did. It's for a nursery and a, the Goan Community Centre. Um, so we see here, this it's located here. The project. This is a, a, a very big development. So uh, the competition was for this for this uh, building, where the developer is supposed to give something to the community as exchange for, for being able to develop this area. So this is, this is all housing. And um, so, so in a way, the main entrance comes from here. So, so this nursery mark, somehow it deals with the entrance, it deals with the park, and it deals with the, let's say, the rather high dense density housing on the other side. And, um, and the time frame was really tight. So the, the project we propose is basically uh, an almost square building volume with uh, kind of a, a continuous rhythm of windows around all four sides so that the building in a way addresses every direction in an equal manner. And, and then we've attached different types of canopies that um, would basically then for example, serve here to the front. This little canopy is the entrance for the, the community center, which will be on the top floor. This long roof uh, forms the entrance to the nursery. And then on the back side, there's a little roof which creates a kind of a colonnade, which is the transition from 
the kindergarten to, to the backyard. And you see the same thing again on the, on the side plan. And we've constructed the, the building with cross-laminated timber. And this is other two floor plans. And what we've tried to find is uh, kind of basically cut the building in half. So each floor has one continuous space with, with uh, light from three sides. And then basically two strips of functional rooms which, which swallow all the, the um, let's say, the practical needs. And now you see a, a view from the the development uh, towards towards the nursery, and somehow the idea was that this canopy mediates somehow the scale from the building, uh, with this kind of brings it down to the scale of the kids. I mean, it's still tall enough so an adult can walk through, but um, it it's, it it creates kind of a yeah a little niche, and then obviously in in the UK. Um, People are quite concerned with surveillance and, and privacy. So this was actually an element that would create a kind of a, a visual separation between the housing development and then the, the kind of the nursery outdoor space. You see from the garden, there's some uh, tennis courts again closer up of the canopy. So this is kind of where the parents, they, there's a, a gate here, so the, 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 the playground is behind. They park their prams here and kind of bring in and out the, the kids or out there. There's the, the small canopy that kind of makes the transition to the, the play area. And to, yeah, in a way, what we realized, and that maybe also is the transition to the next project, is that um, somehow, the, the, let's say, uh, the, the generosity of this outer space on this curved room, curved uh, uh, canopy, it, it's, it's a space where in the, 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 the nursery, they still struggle what to do with it, but we felt that it's somehow really important to have this space which um, which is not clearly defined, where it gives room to, um, how do you say, to figure out what to do with the space, but it's kind of big enough to, um, to, to allow for that. These are space, it's, it's a perspective from inside the, the nursery. Um, it's the upper floor, the, the community center, they use it for all sorts of venues, so it's, 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 um, it's all open. And um, so this is a project in, in Holland. It's, uh, it, this one program is quite different. It's, it's, it's basically here. It's, it's a building for, um, a service building for a sailing harbor. Uh, you see here that it's, uh, it's about an hour from Amsterdam. There's the, there's the, the main river. Um, so basically, that's, that's how the landscape looks, very flat. And the brief was to create a hub where people arrive. They kind of, they can, uh, it has all the facilities, harbor master, uh, toilets, um, uh, and where people basically prepare, repair uh, their boats and where they meet. And um, we've tried to find a way um, we're looking for kind of a way to materialize the building that is in a way low tech and high tech at the same time because of course it's it's a kind of utilitarian building so uh, this one we've 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 built in uh, two layers of brick uh, painted green and it's the same inside and outside and then uh, the roof is constructed from a, it's it's basically a continuous solar um, solar panel and um Again, the, the plan, we try to bring it down to basically four rooms. Um, and the, those rooms are not connected with each other. So at the, at the top, 
This is an open platform, that's where you arrive with bicycle stands, etc. Um, you enter through the middle, and then there's, this is, and that's kind of maybe the, the link to the last project, the, the roof extends all the way to the outer edge and creates this very big sheltered outdoor space. And this is basically where the circulation happens between, between those rooms. Um, this is for, uh, yeah, it's uh, the, the bathrooms, etc. the entrance, um, kind of a workshop, and the harbor master who sits on the corner can look into the three different directions. That's what you see from the arrival. It's, it's only the gates that somehow characterize each of those the, uh, the rooms. The, this one is open where you, where you enter. And um, the, this roof uh, is basically a, a, a double glass where the solar panels are integrated in between the two layers. And what happens is that, um, depending on the weather, it starts to cast like this shadow pattern. So uh, even though it's kind of a, a bit of a dry, repetitive building, it really changes depending on, on the, the, the weather condition. In a, in, a, in, a, in a very nice way, in a way. So the stronger the grid, the, the more energy it produces. And um, this is the space that I was mentioning before. It's this open space where we were not sure yet with the client what do we do with it, and um, how, we're also not so sure how the, 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 the people would actually use it. And, and it turns out to be the most, uh, kind of the most, successful room of, the, of those four because uh, because it opens up to the river and because there's there's a certain kind of space so the harbor master in his office um, he has a big round window to to look into the yeah. view of the, the the washing facilities and it basically sits, it, it kind of interrupts that path, the kind of walk path that, that wraps the entire um, sailing uh, harbor facility. Then um, I think there's two, two more projects. This one is a bit of a longer one and, and what we thought is maybe more interesting is to basically um, walk from literally from building to building in a way because because we we've, it's, it's also in Holland and it's uh, along the the Rhine it's a bottom, yeah. close to um, close to Arnhem and uh, we've started this I think six years ago and so it's basically that's the plot here uh, it has one uh, kind of old villa from that was uh, existing and um, and at the beginning, there, there was actually no clear brief. So the client said, "Can you, you have to, we have to find out what can we do here and what should we do here." And so in the end, what we've done is we, um, of course, as the project developed, and they realized that they do want to have a certain amount of housing units there. So it, in the end, there's now I think 40 housing units. But we broke them down um, into eight buildings, and the, it's a very beautiful park, this one, um, and it has a kind of a history. And we wanted to keep that park intact as basically the shared element and kind of the backbone of the community, because this is a very nice uh, um, and alive residential road, and we wanted this to somehow be part of that that entire community. And there's a path here that runs down to the river. You'll see the, so that's basically the, before the intervention, the, the existing villa, there's a kind of a ruin wall. You get a feel for the, the tr I mean, the trees are, are very impressive. There's a, the rhine in the background. And so what we've done in the end is we, we divided this, the, this, yeah, this project into three clusters. So there's the kind of a, 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 a U-shaped square that 
that's de defined around um, basically two new buildings joins the existing villa. Then there's one building that's kind of lost in the trees. And then there's a third um, cluster, which is yeah, these four buildings that form like a, a communal allotment garden in the center. And we've, the reason why we like this, this, this floor plan is that we wanted it to read more like, a, a, in a way, a field of rooms. So, um, and, and each set of rooms, they have, a, they have a different quality because the site, it slopes here from the top, it slopes down here to the river. Um, the site has a lot of different types of qualities and we try to make, instead of having one design gesture that rules the entire, um, let's say, community or the, the architecture of the community, we try to really break it down into, into individual parts. And one thing that, um, that's been kind of an important part uh, is these blue areas, because in order for, let's say, for, for the inhabitants to share this park, it somehow was very important to, to define the threshold between your private internal space, then in blue you see the private exterior spaces with then, which then make the connection to the to the shared to the shared part um, this uh, I'll, I'll so what I'll do is I I explain these two are, are completed now this one is under construction and these guys they they were just finished so no one has moved in yet uh, and this one is it this is a restaurant um, which uh, I think will open in, in July. So I, I'll show these two buildings uh, in a bit more detail and then we'll just briefly walk through the other ones. So this is uh, what we call uh, building one because it was the first one completed. And um, so what's particular about this one is that there's a similarity to the, to the, the nursery center that I showed you before, in the way that it, because it's kind of in the middle of everything, the roads, the view to the Rhine, the, the Klingelbeck estate, um, we, we developed this as, as a building with, with no front and back, so there's four, four more or less identical facades, and, it's, and there's a, a balcony that wraps around the entire perimeter. It varies in depth, but um, you can almost walk all the way around. And so the, the outer columns, they carry the balcony, the inner columns, they're on the warm side and carry the building. And besides, uh, let's say, those two structural walls and the shafts, the idea is to have a, a kind of a building that gives most flexibility. So it's really like a structure that, um, that allows for different types of apartment configurations. So the, the, the layout changes from, uh, from floor to floor. And what happens is that this kind of thick belt of columns that uh, wrap the, the facade, it's, you start to, it's the, the columns, they start to resonate with the trees on the outside and, um, yeah, and, and, and really create like a, this in-between space uh, between the kind of the private, the private and the, the park. And the thing is that with, um, yeah, with, commercial, with, with commercial development is, is that these balconies are always a gray zone because uh, uh, they, in a way they, they're not really valued. And, and it, but it's a problem because in a way the ex the, the, these balconies and the private exterior spaces, they give such a quality to the, to the, to kind of to the in internal spaces. So the, the, the developer in this case, we've tried to push it and we, we try to maximize the, the outdoor space. Um, so on the, on the north side, it's a bit more, it's about a meter deep, um, but it's, it still gives a certain level of uh, privacy. Then there's the, the east and the west side, it's about a meter 80. And towards the south, um, it's three meter deep on, on, on that side. And then we occasionally then the, 
th there's connections between these private outdoor spaces and the shared one to allow different ways to circulate through the yeah through the, through, through the park. In this case, we we yeah the materialities we try to strip it down to to kind of the structure itself um, and to kind of functional surfaces uh, or. Uh, sad materials and uh, the rain pipes are green and uh, we try to work with the, the let's say the the few elements you need to you, you need to have um, then maybe last the um, the whole building is uh, is is slightly lifted off the ground in the car park um, it's basically here in the bottom. And we wanted the car park to, to really have a connection, an open connection to, to the landscape and to not hide the cars, but they really become part of your... They are part of your everyday life and they, and, and they should... Uh, and that space should also have a quality. So, the, so you basically, yeah, you, you park on the kind of this semi-floor and um, have still the connection to the outside and the view to the outside. Yeah, let's show perspectives from the, from the interior. So every room has a has basically um, tried to. Every room has a kind of intim, kind of a close close uh, relationship to the to the outside and to the outer facade. It's interesting because um, from country to country the kind of there's different habits of living in, in Holland in particular um, I don't know if you've wandered through this, the streets that usually you can always look into people's homes. They're usually the curtains are open and I think there's a it's kind of roots back to a tradition, I think, uh, where the king wanted to visit uh, visit the city and see see the people. So they they actually um, so they literally opened the curtains and and it's interesting how everyone tried to kind of establish a diff different way to inhabit this kind of open glass facade, which. Then what you see here in the background is, is the, the second building I we wanted to introduce. It's very different. It's, it's basically three terraced houses. This is one narrow one at the back and then two wider ones in the foreground. And what's quite particular here is that um, it's really about the relationship between the front and the back. There's two conditions. So you see here that's, that's the, let's say, the, the pond side where the terrain is a little bit lower, um, which is kind of here. Uh, and then there's the, the square side that, that this building shares together with the existing villa, um, which is on that side. And here we, we, we treated it more like a kind of a sequence of different sized rooms. Um, and what's quite particular is that um, they're not only on different levels because this party is lower and this is higher, but for example, this room, the, basically the gray hatched rooms are outdoor rooms. So this is the patio and this is one. So the entrance is via this little patio, then you enter the door here and um, yeah, then the, can, the rooms unfold on the inside. And in fact, the different tenants kind of used the rooms in, in slightly different ways. Some open connected them some uh, uh, divided them like like shown here but in a way the the key in a yeah this the, that's that's these kind of blue zones that I was describing before somehow it's a section so again you, you see uh, the, the kitchen here is sandwiched between these two outdoor rooms and you see the kind of the entrance patio. And in this case, the, the, because the facade is such a clear um, facade, uh, 
this, this, and in the end, they, they all live quite close together here. These little patios, they've been quite key to, to negotiate the, the kind of privacy amongst each other. Um, so that this is basically where uh, you would have their, I guess, their the dining table in, in the warm days, if it's not raining. Um, but then there's still the, the connection to the outside, which then becomes the negotiation um, with, the, with the neighbors. In some cases, they come out, these platforms. Uh, you see the, the other building with uh, building one in the background. And um, so I would move on now to this, this, this guy. So there's this, the ruin wall behind which we've, we've, um, we're now building a, a, it's a one family house. And this one is based on a quite a classic nine room grid. So um, these are the structural walls here, yeah, this, this kind of hashtag. And um, there's the ruin wall on that side. So we, we still keep the old entrance. So that's still the main entrance, but it's on the, then you, you get into a kind of outdoor space. Uh, and from there on, you're kind of in the house. So there's, there, there's a door here, but um, there's no more doorbell or anything. And from then on, it's just a sequence of these rooms. And as a kind of design strategy, and because it's a one-family house with a lot of kids, um, there's a lot of discussion with the clients: how how do they want to live, and how do they want to, where you know, where do they want to have a view? And we've actually changed the functions of rooms several times during the design process. The kitchen was here, then it was there, then it was there. But the one thing that survives is really this, the kind of the main, um, let's say the main grid of the house, whereas then the, you see the, the central rooms, so this one, always here on the side. These are the public rooms. So we have now the kitchen here, uh, conservatory, uh, living room. Whereas the corners, as you circulate across the corner here, the corner rooms are bypassed. So the public circulation runs like this. So these corners became the private rooms, the bedrooms, uh, the office, um, toilets, uh, pan, uh, kitchen. Uh, and, and these are all wooden partition walls which, which can be removed later on. But what makes this, uh, what it looks fairly simple and planned, but because the terrain falls down, similar to the previous building, in fact, each room is on a different height. So, if you see here, this is a section through the, the entrance patio, and these are the different rooms that we just looked at, and they all shift in height. And so basically, what is a single story from, from the square side, you can spiral up, uh, basically to a double height, so that's that's a terrace, or you spiral down, and then there's a two-story part here towards the towards the uh, towards the garden. And the key elements that basically creates the circulation are uh, these small staircases that then create a movement around the central room, which is which is an outdoor room. So this is from the construction site. This is one of those corner stairs that bypass the room that's here on the left um, and you go from the middle segment to another middle segment and it beca really becomes some form of landscape um, so when you that's kind of the this in between space between the ruin wall on the right side and the new building on the left and these central rooms here they all connected with this slightly bigger window so you can you can w look across uh, basically um, the entire building when you are one of those central spaces. This is a view from uh, from a, one of these corner rooms, which are bypassed, and they all have this kind of uh, curved wall where you can kind of you can sense the. 
the kind of stair movement that that runs around it. It's a view from the, the kind of the garden into the, the living room and then kind of steps up the inside. Yeah, it's, and we're constructing this one with, with it's, it's like a monolithic construction, so it's just one 40 centimeter thick uh, brick wall and it's just ren it's rendered inside and outside. Uh, the same walls continue through the entire um, building, so uh, it's just kind of a, a material that actually made it a bit easier to construct it with the different levels and the changes between indoor indoor rooms and, and outdoor rooms. And it's the view where you see that one segment on the corner that we rotated, which has this curve. Another On our staircases. Here it's still missing. So the, the wall is to come. <clears throat> and the view to kind of the last part of this project, which is this this um, allotment garden cluster, it's, and this is two of those buildings. So you see them here, here in the background. Um, and so this this is basically again two this is two these are two terraced houses so uh, uh, one division here here we we did a different uh, introduced a different element it's kind of a freestanding wall that creates this wedge shaped uh, outdoor space because the main entrance comes from here so somehow it creates this uh, in between space. Then uh, these are two apartment buildings, the long one and the square one. This one here is, is more like a, a linear enfilade of rooms with, the, out, with the, the terraces here on these corners facing the, this, the square. And then the, the, the kind of another nine room grid where the outer corner is also an outer space. And this one, kind of an important, it's a single story building, but that, that one has always been designed as kind of a, a building where we don't know yet what will happen. So it was originally um, supposed to be uh, atelier spaces that can be used or rented by, by uh, the tenants of, 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 of this community. Um, and now we're, we're turning it into a restaurant. So they found someone who, who run this uh, entire space. Um, and then basically it has a green, the entire roof is a, is a green, a thick green roof, so they use the roof and then the allotment garden to, to produce their, some part of their, the vegetables. Um, yeah, that's, that's a view towards this square. And it was, was important to ha to have some moments of density, so so there's some of these these buildings here, and you'll see, um, and you'll see later if you go around the corner, where they're actually very close to each other, and somehow um, it felt quite important that when there's a lot of space, to also have moments where there's no space. Um, so you the view from the across the allotment garden, and then there's these moments where there's actually quite a bit of space, and then uh, those, those uh, gaps create use and transitions into the, to the landscape. Again, here, the, here we, we piled all the outdoor rooms on that corner. Um, it's a view of this corner from, from the inside. basically from balcony to balcony. Then the, the last one is that the, basically the, these two semi-detached buildings. Um, and this one is, is 
again built in uh, cross laminated timber. Um, and it's uh, just a two story, two story center. On the one side, it has the it's facing this this little wall that I showed you before, and then on the other side, it's facing the the allotment garden. Um, that's the last project, and I hope you still have some energy. Um, this is, we thought we'll finish with the, with the work in progress. Um, it's a new project that we work on now for one or two years. And um, it, this is also, it's more like a, what do you call it? Uh, um, there's an existing, it's an, an existing industrial park. So it's this part here. And there used to be, a, or there is an old toothpaste factory here. Um, and we've developed a kind of a master plan or like a, a, a massing for several buildings to come in this area. Um, and this, this is already in development for quite a while. So. Um, this round square you see in the middle is, is already there for a couple of years. Um, there's a new building already uh, put in place. And what's quite particular is that this, this area really grow over time. So the, the factories, they, they were built they, uh, by the same architect, but um, incrementally over time. And you can feel that in the grain of that, uh, that urban grain. Um, there's a very nice uh, combination of very small, um, very intimate streets. And now these, these buildings they have been now repurposed with uh, there's um, shops and ateliers and uh, there's school, um, restaurants. There's a lot of different functions now. Um, and that square here is basically the central piece uh, to the, to, so this it's called the new Estad, the new, the new city. And um, I, I'm not gonna talk much about the master plan, but maybe focus only just on one building that we're working on now, which is this one here. So it's maybe not so clear on this plan, but this is the factory. This is an existing building a new one, and then these gray hatched buildings here are the volumes that we've developed, and it, we're working on this one here and on this one, and then other practices work on, on these other buildings, and they basically, this is uh, four stories and it goes up to uh, 16 stories. And at the moment, uh, there's, uh, there's not much, so the road layout will be changed. Um, but there's, there's these uh, pavilions that are there uh, as a temporary element for, I think, five years now. Um, it will be relocated. And so that will be the site for three buildings. And the one, so we're, we're basically uh, the first building. So normally we, tr we, we prefer to react to a condition but in this case, there's no, there's no really condition. Um, but we know there will be this one here, one here. There will be a big building here. And then there's existing buildings on that side. And again, and maybe it's kind of a, a pattern that, that we just enjoy, is that we try to look for a building that, that talks in an equal manner to all four, four sides. And, and we've, we imagine a kind of a a skirt or like a canopy that wraps the entire plinth level in the, on the perimeter of the building to, to basically move the pedestrian moment up around these buildings. And um, the rotation of this building in relation to the other two crates, these two triangulated um, streets or, or, yeah, streetscapes. And um, 
if you look back on the left side, there's big, historic pictures from, from that site. There's a, there's a river called the Aem. You see here, these are the warehouses I've been showing you before. The Aem is here at the foreground. Um, this silo, this one here, is no longer there, but we, we, we really liked it. Uh, somehow there's, there's a, let's say, uh, a mass to it, but, and a pragmatism, but also kind of an elegance to this one. Um, and there used to be one across the, across the river, there was another one called Kova, another silo. And then, of course, there's the, um, uh, the skyscraper of homes, um, or high-rise of homes, which, which kind of felt appealing for, um, for this particular uh, place. So we, we developed this skeleton um, with not so, not so different to, to building one that I showed to you earlier, which uses the exterior space, in this case the skeleton or like a shelf that wraps the entire building to uh, place planters, to then start to mediate the transition or the kind of the, the proximity to the buildings that will will come. And then another thing, um, the skeleton or the structure then carries the, the, the obviously the, the mechanical components. And in this case, because, because in Holland you need, um, each building is basically calculated on its own. So when it comes to energy consumption, also there's, a, there's, let's say, a high, a high degree of solar panels that have to be incorporated in, into the architecture. And in this case, um, and it's a principle we've developed for this entire um, project, um, the thing with solar panels is that, to go back to the idea of the guests, it's a technology that, that's, um, it's, uh, let's say, very popular now, and it's been pushed by by the authorities and um, and it's performing, but it's quite likely that in 10 or 20 years uh, this technology will change. And then we we dis we looked at options: do we integrate them into the facade or not? Or um, and in the end, we tried to really. I mean, you, you, on, on that uh, screen here, you don't see it so well, but we basically grouped all the solar panels in quite big uh, steel structures or tr trusses that run across the entire roof in the, ideal, uh, in the ideal location in relation to the sun, um, completely ignoring basically the building. So in a way, um, maybe a little bit similar to one of the slides Chris showed earlier where um, he showed our experiment of how do we fix the solar panels to kind of an existing uh, f uh, window um, the idea is to to really it's like an it's like a an add-on which works well when it's there but it can also be removed and um, the the project is it's constructed there's basically a concrete table which need negotiates the parking level with the let's say a more com uh, flexible commercial floor and then on top the remaining 10 floors are constructed in, 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 in wood with, with a prefabricated concrete balconies that wrap the, the perimeter. Yeah, you see it a bit better um, on the short side. And then the different kind of uh, alleyways that, it, that the building will frame together with with the neighbor buildings. Another debate um, that, that, that we're engaging for this project and also the other buildings of this, of this site is how to, how to manage um, the plants. Because, because it's such a dense cluster of buildings, we felt that it's really important that, um, that there's a kind of a functioning, uh, how do you say, uh, that there's a, there's a logic to how to, how to run the, 
on how to maintain these planters that wrap the entire uh, perimeter. Um, there's still, we haven't solved it yet fully, but uh, it's, it looks always easy on the picture and the idea is uh, obviously not to, to color it in green, but to, um, to really find a kind of sustainable solution where um, to make sure that the plants actually grow. And it's, it kind of sounds easy, but the, the more you think about it, the more interesting it becomes. Um, and it's also kind of a bit of a danger when you do architectural representation. You make it green and it, it somehow uh, is, is an easy way out. But to, um, so we're working with the landscape uh, practice um, to, to see how do you, um, how is it accessed, is it communally kind of uh, maintained and watered, etc. Another thing, um, so this is a very, so, so basically the, the building is based on these uh, CLT walls that run in a kind of a quite straightforward rhythm with vertical shafts that we spread across the plan. So we basically designed the, the, the worst case scenario with the most dense uh, configuration of apartments to then give most, let's say, most flexibility for later. Um, then another thing, so here we pushed the balconies to, I think, two meters 60, which, um, which in a way, it's like a sweet spot between the daylighting because it's one, one, one direction oriented apartments uh, between the daylighting and the, the kind of the generosity we ca kind of need to, to give outer spaces to the units. The, the ceiling, we try to push the ceiling high to, to 3 meter 20 clear so that it could be used as uh, for working and also for living. I think that's the last slide to finish. Today's talk. Thank you so much. Yep, yep. Thank you, Max and uh, Chris. Uh, are there any questions? Question I just didn't catch. Um, last project, where where was that? Oh, that's uh, in Amersfoort. Amersfoort is um, in Holland. Everything is one or two hours away from each other. But uh, it's um, it's. Uh, I don't know if you know how, how how well you know Holland. It's like an hour from Amsterdam, basically. The project is uh, it's. It's close to the center of Amersfoort, and it's um, it's actually it's a special case because for the city it's a very important site because they they want to create because it's on the AM this river which leads straight into the historic center, and um, the reason why it's interesting is because the this this because it's in the interest of the city to to kind of push it forward. There's a um, let's say. Uh, there's like a collaborative approach to the urban planning and to the to the phasing of the project. Um, I, I try another question. Uh, thanks a lot for a wonderful presentation. And uh, I was wondering about this project where you, oh, I don't remember it, the name of it was the one before the last one. You had one house that you called one building or something. A building one, yeah. <laughs> so, or, all right. But what's, what's interesting there for me was the way you discussed uh, private exterior space in relation to collective exterior. You also mentioned that uh, balconies are a kind of problematic space in commercial buildings. And I didn't really understand why and in relation to what and 
Yeah, I misunderstood completely. <laughs> no, no, it's uh, it's actually very it's very basic. The 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 developers they don't they cannot they don't, cannot put a price tag on the balcony, so they try to minimize them. And uh, and so it's not really valued uh, as an outdoor space as such. So normally working with the minimum outdoor space given by the legislation, at least in Holland, but in this case, the, uh, it's a kind of a question how to, to deal with it. It obviously creates, the, how do you say, the qualities are obvious, but it's, it's not a given for many buildings. So it's, it's yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very <laughs> simple trend. But in this case, the the other thing is because um, we, in order to find a, a principles for the different buildings within this shared park, um, we use this, let's say, these private outdoor spaces as a way to to mediate between the landscape and between the private in, interior of the apartments. I mean, very primitive questions, but, but when, yeah. But normally, I mean, in the beginning, normally we were considering to split up the plots, right? Normally you would create plots with fences and houses or uh, semi-detached houses, but in this case, we really wanted to keep the garden shared. So that was, so the result in the end was therefore not to have any fences, but just work with these pockets of private spaces within this shared landscape. Inspiring the way that you try to present um, your work at different scales from different building concepts, so you can inspire the way that you know, your work needs to scale um, through a kind of common lens without you know, narrowing it down too much. So maybe this question is to um, a little bit too general, so we'll see how it goes. But I really enjoy this this lens or perspective that you're presenting of the hierarchies of permanence, let's say. Um, and I was also curious about this, the second to last project that you present. Um, if, if that sort of lens or way of approaching architecture is relevant, or I'm assuming it's relevant, but in, in what sense? Um, because when you're talking about guests, you mentioned briefly your kitchen. It's clear there. And then some of the, the projects that you mentioned, you're getting sense into the, the artist's studio. line of thinking is still there, it becomes more complex in the studio. So if you wanted to address that. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously it's more complex and more difficult, uh, but what we tried to do in that project was somehow, I mean, the focus is then on creating good rooms, basically, you know? and the idea is that in the future, you can move functions. I mean, it's difficult, obviously, to move water and electricity, etc., to accommodate different uses. But still, the idea is that the rooms are not designed specifically for one purpose, but they're generous enough to, in order to accommodate different functions. That was the idea, and that's why you see they, many of those buildings are quite classical in their plan, these enfilade of rooms. So there's not many corridors, but they're more like rooms uh, that somehow yeah, offer opportunities for, for the, the people living there to change. But uh, the, our aspiration is somehow maybe in the future to push this even more and make buildings that then are easier to adapt or change. It, it's, it sometimes it's more apparent, sometimes it's less apparent. And uh, I think that the, the, the difficulties is we know we have to make buildings that are adaptable because, I mean, we worked on the competition in, in Paris and the, the the legislation or the kind of requirements by the city, they are already completely tailored towards um, this level of versatility. But 
but in a, in a, let's say for these residential projects like this, to um, it's not so easy to to bring together this ambition with the particular interest of of a client at a particular time. So that's that's where um, I guess that the only way is to find a, a kind of a language that works with both. So you have on the one hand side a, a building that has a the kind of it's, it's, let's say generous or neutral enough to to be used in different ways, but at the same time it has to tick all the boxes of you know whoever we are building it for because um, of course there if uh, you build a house for someone else, their mind is uh, they have an idea and a dream to do to 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 build and Maybe they're also quite overwhelmed then with thinking too much into a possible future. So I, I think it's it's impossible to do everything in one go. But I guess that's the cha the general challenge. Um, there's there's maybe contexts where it's much more um, obvious. So with the students, we for example two years ago we worked on a site for. Um, biggest developer in the UK and they were building buildings on, on top of um, a tube station and they have to cast the foundations now for a building to be built in five years, or ten, six years. And they had literally that problem, they say they, we don't know what, we don't actually know what the market will want, so we have to design a building without knowing if it's an office or residential or commercial which in a weird way kind of met exactly the brief that we gave of the students to design backwards. And so there it would be completely a, an a complete appropriate, um, let's say, presentation. Whereas if it's a specific site, like a residential site, where it's, it's let's say the brief is, is defined, it's different, then it's less obvious and then maybe also a bit more challenging for us or all the other architects to, to find kind of a, an interesting solution. Uh, thank you for the lecture. I have another question. Um, something I got quite excited about in the beginning was uh, maybe, yeah. I don't know if this is just uh, something I suspect or if it's there and I mean, maybe that's why it's a question. Um, there seems to be like a, merging between furniture and architecture. You show this pillar that's a light and then it's also some kind of spatial division between uh, zones and then um, in this building one there was a pillar doing the kind of same thing in front of the entrance dividing between the, the two entrances and I'm wondering if, if this ideas from these two furniture and architecture or something that you let inform each other? Yeah, <coughs> I think so, yeah. I mean, looking at the presentation from the side, it also becomes quite apparent that these patterns kind of, I start to see everywhere, kind of uh, things keep popping up, like the column here, or, but, um, yeah, I, I mean, we, we've been doing a lot of exhibition design on interiors and also buildings. Uh, and somehow uh, doing the exhibition designs really allowed us to just focus on the interior, on the space, on movement and furniture and objects, etc. And I think uh, we really enjoy that. And uh, I think for us, if, if, if a building is adaptable or a good quality building, it's sort of simple, good rooms, and then it's all up to the furniture in order to create function, no? So there's this thing which says the, uh, a bedroom is a room with a bed. So in, that's kind of our mindset, that we design rooms and then we design furniture. So we work on both things at the same time, but we like the furniture to be furniture, objects, not built into the architecture, but also freestanding, independent elements. 
because there's these moments where they somehow weirdly merge with yeah, each with other. Yeah, with a fixed column is yeah, a contradiction, but... Uh. I guess it's a thought that kind of keeps on evolving. And um, I mean, the projects you've seen today, they, they run across quite a long time span. So, we, so that's a... Um, um, ideas, they kind of... Projects, they inspire each other. And we look back and you, s you, s you learn from the old projects, you see a pattern and some s a, a kind of an unconscious idea becomes a lot more apparent eventually. And um, then obviously you have to make a presentation and you play with that in some way. <laughs> I, I have an, thank you again for the presentation. And the uh, main question also being that you uh, talked about so much and I'm coming to the end is that you said that you work for like 10 years in London and now you moved to Porto and Palma and you have projects in the Netherlands and I'm quite curious how your practice is organized as you've been working in different countries and you know, also in different uh, relations uh, context and just happened somehow, but uh, uh, yeah, we're based throughout Europe a bit, and I mean, in order for us to function, we really need to collaborate. No? So, uh, for instance, in, in Holland, we work with local architects, both because we don't really know the context that well in, sort of, in terms of regulations, but also uh, the fact that we're quite a small office, so we need people to do part of the technical design together with us, or the legislative work, etc. So, I mean, we decided a while ago that we just wanted to become quite small and flexible, but still try to do bigger projects. And then the way to do that for us uh, at the moment is just, yeah, collaborate. Well, yeah, and then uh, COVID happens and Brexit happens, and those things, they somehow stimulate they push you a little bit towards what you've been kind of thinking about or dreaming about and then and um, so in a way it was a good excuse to to so we have one one architect that's based in Brussels um, and uh, we work with one uh, in London and it's interesting because um, obviously you you lose some momentum because you don't share a space together but we try to meet um, try to meet like uh, literally maybe every maybe two or three times a year I mean we, we talk, obviously talk every day but and that's really important um, but then on the other hand you also get uh, like the fact that everyone is exposed to a different culture and a different language and a different context it's really stimulating in a way and um, and, and that, that's a very interesting dynamic. And we don't know yet how we go, which direction we'll drive it, but um, so far it's, it's... And we don't know if it's effective or really working, but I mean, it's an experiment a bit. But I don't, it wouldn't have worked. We worked together very closely for 10 years, so it's kind of okay to not see each other every day. We do understand each other quite easily, but uh, yeah, I think that's important. And people who work for us also come, for instance, to Porto and work for a few months to, to get to know you, because otherwise, you, yeah, just over Zoom is not the most efficient investment. You don't know them. Does that answer your question? Did, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for a very inspiring lecture. Uh, I have a question regarding your uh, working process. Uh, nice to see how you start in, in this economical manner with materials and so then that's, I see that uh, it merges uh, as I see it, uh, a close work with proportions and, and a playful uh, way to handle the scale uh, which I, I think is very inspiring and I really admire this approach uh, one could say that like a good room will find its own use uh, and it's sustainable in, 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 in that sense and, and maybe it could in so many other senses. 
Um, so I'm really interested in this process that, that goes between like the general and the specific, because it's, it's a kind of a balance between the general and the specific. It, it, it's got to become too general, it becomes kind of useless. Then it becomes too specific, it becomes too narrow. So, there, so it's, I mean, there is a, like a, a point where those two meet. And the question is, how do you, how do you get there? Do you, and that's, that is my question regarding your process. How, how do you get there? I mean, do you, do you start with a general and try to like inhabit it with the guests? Or, or, or do you start on the other way around with a, something very specific and you try to, to zoom out to, to achieve the quality of the, the general? Um, how, how, how does it work? Or, or do you massage the project until it, it have both of these qualities? Yeah, may, maybe one thing to start with is that there's a difference between smaller projects and bigger projects. Because I think um, the Arch Studio, the, the first building we presented, that's, that's quite a while ago. And um, it's the kind of project where because of its constraints, it um, gives you leverage to, ex you, know, you, you have to basically experiment with materiality and, um, but then if you, once you start questioning materiality, you, you also experiment with the form of it. And there's, that's one world, but then when as the buildings get bigger uh, with the projects, it doesn't, it doesn't translate uh, as the same, in the same way. Um, so that's that's maybe one challenge that we're also kind of facing. Um, but otherwise we work with, we look obviously at, let's say, we walk through the worlds with open eyes and absorb, uh, and you start to collect aspects and moments and materials and things that we feel attracted to in a very liter literal way. And then when we start, start the design process, we basically um, collect those and you create associations between a particular context and the brief, and maybe interesting fragments you found or that's a very common approach. But, and then to work through iteration, design iterations. Um, I mean, we don't work a lot with model making because the way we set up the office, so it's, it's a very digital way of working, a lot of free 3D modeling. And um, the judging is always made in a perspective, so never really in the 3D program. So, and that helps a little bit to boil, to boil down to what you see. So um, as you sta stand in the, in the building, as you stand on the street, it's a very literal judgment of what you're trying to create. And then, uh, and then it becomes really convoluted. You talk to the client, he wants something, you talk to the planner, he wants something else. And then we discuss and he wants something else. <coughs> and eventually you, you work through this process. Uh, but I think this, the kind of, the iterations of working with pers perspectives to, to basically rep to represent what we're, what we're talking about. Um, and then you reflect on it in the, in the drawing and see does it, you know, does it make sense? Is it simple enough um, or is it clear enough? And then eventually some, the project say, evolves in some way. Yeah. But I think what works well in smaller projects where there's a kind of a clear kind of uh, construction and then there's these moments that question maybe some of the rules you've set up which start to make the charm of the building. It doesn't, you cannot do the same in a bigger building because it becomes uh, a gesture in a strange way. So that's, that's quite challenging. And we're, yeah. And in a way that the furniture is a thing that it maybe partly comes from that because it's a way to, uh, to interact with the, with the rooms you create and to add one more layer. Uh, I have a question. Um, it's about 
a trend I've observed in general, but I think it was also visible in your last two projects that, as you said yourself, your interior space has become a bit more general and generic. Yeah, like you even said classical, like it's the idea of the space uh, taking, you know, front row before the function, let's say, if we can face this shift since the, you know, functionalist modern movement, let's say. But then I look at the, city, the scale of the city and I see the reverse happening, right? So when you worked with this master plan and when you worked with the last project in, was it Amersfoort? No, this was Amersfoort, yeah, the, the previous one, when you had the whole plot and then you decided to have a cluster of different clusters of buildings that were very, let's say, specific in their configuration and their layout in the, on an urban scale. What is happening here? Like, why is there this reversal? Uh, how do you think about it? Because surely you must think about it. What is it about being so specific on an urban level? Uh, is it functionalism again, or is it not? It seems to me more of a picturesque quality, right? Uh, and I, it's not only you. I've seen this in a lot of uh, offices over the last, say, 10, 15 years. How do you reflect on this kind of shift? Part, I don't know if we reflect on it, but... Uh, I mean, I think it, when it comes to the design of, the, say, that urban plan, Klingerbeck, I think a lot of the, I guess it's a bit picturesque, yeah, and I, a lot of the, the way we developed it was through references. So we had, you know, towns, cities, moments, streets that we like, and we somehow looked at the scale of these places and the heights of the buildings, the, the relationship, the distances between them, and then we tried to create moments like that that had a similar kind of quality. Uh, in that project, we, we actually worked a lot in virtual reality, so we used these sort of grayscale models we walked around in, in one-to-one, -one where you could really experience standing on the balcony next to the other building, looking into their living room, and to get a sense if this really makes sense, or if it's too dense, etc. That was I don't know, we, I guess we developed the, in a way a lot the, the mass thing as an experiential way that you walk through the buildings and you, you, you looked, looked around. Um, Maybe, yeah, to add two things. One is that um, uh, not every building were asked to resolve everything on the inside. So um, there's kind of a limit to our scope. So. We, we basically condense our attention to certain parts of the building that we can actually, that we're supposed to deliver. That's one thing. And then, and then also, I think um, that we kind of decided for today's presentation to have a certain journey through the project, and it was kind of a, a pict picturesque journey. So it was literally walking through the buildings and through the site um, and uh, we didn't want to bore you with too many <laughs> more slides but um, yeah it's it's also I guess I guess it's a uh, um, how do you say yeah the attention automatically shifts a little bit depending on the, the project size the art studio was a purely, sorry? Is it the same developer in this project? Uh, yeah, that, that's the same. The whole master plan is one developer? Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, there's some, some other buildings uh, on the same site where we do everything, but we, it would have exploded in today's time. Right, many questions today. Chris and Max, thank you so much for coming to Stockholm and sharing your work. Uh, it was very nice to see. And next uh, Thursday, we'll have uh, Let and Gori, the Danish firm uh, lecturing. And uh, yeah, on Monday, it's a uh, Årsmöte på Måda, om ni vill komma, och då pratar. Rävjägan så om byggnadsvård om ni är sugna på det. Det var väl allt. Tack så mycket för att ni kom.